YouTube and Facebook, I mean, sermon audio this morning. I'd like for you to take your Bible this morning and turn with me to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. I actually had begun a message from the psalm, and I might go there next week. I'm not real certain. But uh, these verses that we're going to look at this morning just got hung up in my head, and I couldn't get away from them. I've entitled this message, and we won't really deal with it till the very end of this message, but I've entitled this message, An Israelite Indeed. An Israelite Indeed. You say, well, that's an interesting title for a message. Well, just wait till we get to the end. Wait till we get to the end. I tell you, if you go back, and you know, the Gospel of John is just so important. All of God's Word, we know that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be perfect, thoroughly, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. So the entirety of God's Word, from Genesis to Revelation, all of it is for our benefit, for our encouragement. It is for the salvation of God's sheep and for the encouragement of God's elect in this present evil world. But when we think about the Gospels in particular, they all present our Lord Jesus Christ in a different fashion. And the Gospel of John presents the Lord Jesus Christ in his character as who he is. Who is he? He is the Son of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. So we're talking about the eternal Son of God, the everlasting Word of God. And that's the way this this book begins in John chapter 1, describing the divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we know, uh, if you know anything about the Word of God, everything that our Lord did, every word that He spoke, every miracle that He performed, all of it was to confirm that He was indeed the Messiah promised by God, prophesied of by God's prophets, who would actually come in time to save His people from their sins. But if you go back in you, a few verses in this chapter you'll see that the Jews, and this is so important, the Jews were looking for the Messiah. And if you know anything about national Israel, they're still looking for the Messiah, the Jews are. And that word Messiah, it means the anointed, and they were looking for him, these Jews, and I'll describe for you who these Jews are in just a second. The Jews were looking for him so much that, you know what, they sent a group of individuals, some priests, and some rabbis down to inquire John of John the Baptist in his baptismal ministry. Listen, look, listen to this. In verse 19 through 22 of John chapter 1, and this is the record. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? Because they're looking for Messiah, and they're curious. And so they send men to ask him, who art there? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I'm not the Christ. See, that's what they wanted to know. Are you the Christ? Or should we look for another? He said, I'm not the Christ. And they ask him, well, what then? Are, are you a lies? And he saith, I'm not. Art thou that prophet? And he said, no. Then said they unto him, who art thou? That we may give answer to them that sent us, what sayest thou of thyself? Now, I need to, to, to get this clear as to who's, who's sent down here inquiring. This word, the Jews, you know, it said, they said that when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask, that word the Jews means belonging to the Jewish nation. But if, if we let the scriptures interpret the scriptures, we know that there is a particular group of Jews in mind here by this statement, the Jews. Who are we talking about? We're talking about the Pharisees. If you look at verse 24, it says, And they which were sent, now they were sent to ask questions who he was, they were sent, who sent them? The Pharisees sent them. The Pharisees sent them. Now keep this in mind this morning. The Pharisees, and the Sadducees, those who were considered masters. Remember our Lord Jesus Christ when he talked to Nicodemus, he said, Thou art a master, you're a teacher in Israel, and you don't know these things about the new birth. So these scribes and Pharisees who were considered masters in Israel, 
They were considered the instructors of all things spiritual to Israel. They were absolutely clueless concerning the true nature and the true purpose of the Messiah promised of God and prophesied about, about in the scriptures. How do we know that? Our Lord Jesus Christ stands before these same men who sent these Jews to inquire John the Baptist. He said to them in John chapter 5, verse 39 and 40, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. In other words, you're searching of the scriptures. They thought they had life by their searching the scriptures. And I tell you, you know, there's a lot of people think that, that if they read this book, they're going to get life just because they read this book. Read it cover to cover. I remember when I was in false religion, I... I found a, a, it was actually Mr. Spurgeon's way to read through the Bible once a year where you read so many chapters in the Old Testament, one chapter in the New Testament. You do that every single solitary day of the year. You read through the Bible once a year, every year. And I was dead set on doing that once a year. You can memorize this book. There's people that have. I remember Bill Bradley. He supposedly knew the entire which I can't envision knowing First Second Kings, First Second Chronicles. I, I could see knowing some of them other books, but those books, to know them, be able to quote all them names all the way through. You can quote it, you can know it, you can search it, you can research it. And yet, he says, they are they which testify of who? The one they claim they were looking for. They were looking for Messiah. And you will not come to me that you might have life. Because life's one place. Where is it at? It's in the sun. They, you think about it. These Jews, these Pharisees, and even the Jews today, they're still looking for somebody who would deliver them out from underneath earthly rule and dominion. One who would be like David. And they were absolutely oblivious to the need that they had of salvation from their sins. That's what this was all about. Listen to this. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake. Who's going to do this to them for the, his apostles for their name's sake? The religious people. The Jews. Because they know not him that sent me. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had, hadn't, they had not had sin. Now, let, what's Christ saying? If he had never spoke to them, they were not sinners? No. They had, they had no knowledge of sin. But he says, now that I've come and I've spoken, I've told them what sin is, what righteousness is, what judgment to come is, what? They have no cloak. And the, the, the reality of what these guys knew, what did they know? They had studied the Old Testament. What did Ezekiel tell them? The soul that sins, twice. The soul that sinneth, it shall surely die. You think they'd broke the law? To their mindset, they had not. And I know people like that. You do too. There's people out there that are good people, moral people, kind people. They tell you real quick, well, I, you know, I, I, I hadn't really broke God's law. But here's the thing. Even though the Jews were in darkness concerning the true nature in office of the God-sent Messiah. Thank God God has always had a people in this world who he causes to look for and to find the promised seed. All that the Father giveth me shall come unto me. How many? All that the Father giveth, they shall come where? To the promised seed. And him that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. Now listen, from Eve right after the fall, to Noah before the flood, to Abraham, to Moses at the burning bush, to King David, over into the New Testament, to old Simeon that held our Lord Jesus Christ, and now to John the Baptist and his disciples. And he's mentioned in this test, text that we're looking at this morning. All of them were looking for the Messiah. All of them were. 
John the Baptist, think about it. He was the forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what did he do? He pointed out Christ, not to, he pointed sinners not to himself. Where did he point them to? He pointed them to the Lord Jesus Christ. How did he point them to them? Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Folks, they had been looking for a lamb since God first slew a lamb to clothe our parents in the garden. How do you know that? When she got that first son, when, when Cain was born, what did she say? I have got a man. She was looking for the man because she had a promise. What was the promise? The woman's seed would bruise the serpent's head and he, the serpent, would bruise his heel. From that point forward, everybody's looking for that lamb. And thank God, God typified that lamb. And he always, listen, he never pointed to the temple or the tabernacle or the sacrifices or the ceremonies and ever told them or us or anybody else in history that there was life in any of that. All that pointed where? To the one who was to come, the one whom it typified. So here's John the Baptist, the forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ, pointing sinners to the Lamb of God, Notice what happened in John chapter 1. Look at verse 35. And the next day, this is after our Lord was baptized. The next day after John stood and two of his disciples. Now he's got disciples, followers. And looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith to his disciples that are with him, he points at Christ again and he points him out in his proper character. Behold the Lamb of God. Verse 37. And two, the two disciples heard him speak. Not John. Who'd they hear speak? They heard our Lord speak. Because our Lord said, my sheep hear my voice. They heard our Lord speak. And what'd they do? Read it for yourself. What'd they do? They followed Jesus. And John said, well, I'm just offended at two of my apostles. Thus, I'm going to leave me and follow him. No, because who's, who's John following? John's already said, I'm not worthy to buckle his shoes. Now, John the Baptist was a sinner just like Jesus' mother Mary was. Needing a Savior. Needing a Redeemer. Verse 38, and Jesus turned, and here's these two disciples, and it tells us who one of them is. And from everything that I did in study and research this week, you know, John, the writer of this book, you know, John never refers to himself. He's always, he always refer, he, you know, when he writes of himself, he says the other disciple. Or he says the disciple who put his head on Christ's breast. How do we know that was John? Because the other writers, when they wrote of it, who'd they say John was resting his head on our Lord's chest? So they, most of the writers that I encountered in studying this, they said one of, the, one of the disciples that was following John was the Apostle John, the writer of this book. I don't know. It doesn't really make any difference. But the other one, notice what it says. It says, The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed him. Jesus turned and saw them following, and saith unto them, What seek ye? And they said unto him, Rabbi which is being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? He saith unto them, come and see. What did they do? They came and saw. <laughs> where he dwelt, and they abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was who? Andrew. And Andrew had a brother. His brother was who? Simon Peter. In the verses, these verses, we see our Lord's faithfulness to his office and his work, seeking out and finding his lost sheep, calling them by name to himself. And in this instance, it involved Andrew and his brother Simon Peter, and Andrew heard by the mouth of John the Baptist about Christ as the Lamb of God, and by God's grace he believed, and he followed him. What does that mean? Faith comes how? By hearing 
And hearing comes by the word of God. He followed our Lord, became a disciple of our Lord. And immediately, what does he do? Andrew, he went and sought out his brother, Peter. And he got Peter down on his hands and knees and said, say the sinner's prayer. No, what did he do? He brought him where? He brought him to Christ. Look at verse 41 42. He first findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, We have found. What did I tell you at the beginning of this message? What are they doing? They were all looking for the Messiah. He said, We found the Messiah. We found him. As which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought Peter to Jesus, him to Jesus. And when Jesus saw him, he said, Thou art Simon Peter, son of Jonah, which thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. Can't we safely say and conclude that this is the fulfillment of our Lord Jesus Christ's word, but there were the scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? Jesus answered them, saying, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Here's four of them. He's come to call sinners to repentance. Now keep this in mind as we look at these two next two men, because we want to really zero in on these two guys that are mentioned next here in our text. Look at our text for this morning. Look at verse 43. In the day following, Jesus would go forth unto Galilee and findeth Philip and saith unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Yeah, that's not the only time that's said. <laughs> They're looking for the Messiah, but with a nat to the natural mind, what does is, what is Nathanael say? Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip says, Come and see. Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming and said unto him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no God. Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael answered and saith unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. Thou art the King of Israel. I'll give you five things real quick this morning. The first thing that jumps out at me in this passage that I just read to you is the fact who sought who. <laughs> Our Lord Jesus Christ, what did he do? He sought and found Philip. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee. Philip wasn't coming looking for him. Our Lord goes where he's at, and he he finds this man, Philip. That word translated findeth means after searching to find the thing sought for. Our Lord searched diligently, didn't he? Isn't that, isn't that how he's described? Remember the parable of the 99 sheep and the one that was lost? How did the shepherd look for it? He searched how? Diligently. It's the same word that was used in that both of those parables. You know, the parable of the, the, the 99 sheep and the one that was lost and the parable of the woman with the 10 coins. Nine she had and one fell off. And what did she do? She tore that place apart, searching diligently till she found that one sheep. But see, here's the thing. In any, each instance, whether it was a lost sheep or a lost coin, Andrew, Peter, or now Philip and Nathaniel, they were still all in the same condition. What were they? They were lost. They were without hope in and of themselves. 
But thank God our Lord said that he was not sent, but to who? How do you describe it? The lost sheep. The lost sheep of the house of Israel. When I wrote that into my notes this week, I couldn't help but think about when our Lord Jesus Christ went to that place and found Zacchaeus up in that tree. Remember what he said to Zacchaeus? Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house. He didn't say, I, Today I've come to offer you salvation. What did he say? This day salvation's here in this house. For as much as he, this, this guy, this Levite that everybody hated, that was up in a tree out of curiosity trying to see our Lord Jesus Christ because he was small in stature. He says, this man, he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of God is to come to seek and to save that which was lost. So the first thing we see is what? Lost. And they need a Savior. Here's the second thing this passage teaches us. These men were all brought to a knowledge and understanding that they were sinners. And as sinners, they looked for and they waited for. And by God's grace, they embraced Messiah as their Savior. Listen to these passages. Look at verse 45 and 49. Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, "We." And this is just after he's heard, heard Christ speak. He says, we found him of whom Moses and the law and then the prophets did write. It's not in my notes, but I, I think about over in John chapter 4. Remember that woman at the well? What did she tell our Lord? Remember what she said? She said, we know when Jesus comes, he'll know everything about it. We've been, she was a woman in Samaria. And she said, we know these things. We know. He's down here. We're not Jews. We know. We've heard. And when she went into that town after Christ had delivered her from sin, what'd she tell everybody? She said, come meet a man that had told me everything about my life. Is not this the very Christ of God, the one that's promised? The one that's sent? It said, Nathanael answered and saith unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. The Jews, including the Pharisees and the scribes and the Pharisees, they were looking for a king, weren't they? They were looking for one like David. But as we've already seen, they were looking for the wrong deliverance. And therefore, since they were looking for the wrong deliverance, what did they They were looking for the wrong kind of king. Matter of fact, you think about it, every unregenerate sinner is looking for the wrong king, are they not? Listen to this. This is our Lord was on the cross. And they said to him, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. Now listen to this language here. If he be the king of Israel, let him come down from the cross. Let him come down from the cross and we'll believe him. <laughs> He came off that cross, did he not? He still didn't believe him. But you think about that. On another occasion when our Lord Jesus Christ perceived that they would come and take him and make him a king, a king of what? A king, an earthly king. What did he do? He departed again unto a mountain himself alone. Why? His kingdom's not of this world. Had nothing to do with an earthly kingdom. When our Lord Jesus Christ stood before Pontius Pilate being accused of subverting Roman rule, Pilate asked our Lord Jesus Christ, Art thou a king then? You a king? Our Lord looked at Pontius Pilate and said, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into this world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth, they hear my voice. Folks, the unregenerate mind cannot, nor will it ever bow to the reality that they are under the kingship of sin, that they are under sin's guilt, 
under its penalty and under its condemnation and power. And since they can't see the reality of sin, you know what? Just like these Jews, they don't think they need deliverance from it. Our Lord stood before these same Jews now that have sent out to inquire at him. He spake these words, many believed on him. Get this in your mind. As he spake these words, you'll know the truth, truth sets you free. Spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus unto them, to the Jews, same Jews, which believed on him, they gave middle agreement to him. If you continue in my words, then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, the truth shall make you free. Next words out of their mouth. Then answered they him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, you shall be made free? Christ wasn't talking about freedom from Roman rule. Huh? Talking about a different deliverance. Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committed sin, see, he puts it in context, Father. Whosoever commits sin, what are they? They're under the servitude of what? Not wrong, sin. And listen, the servant abides not in the house. But the Son abides forever. So if the one that's the Son who abides in the house of God forever, if He makes you free, see, they give us a king. He makes you free, you'll be free how? That's, that's the freedom I want. How about you? Free from sin's guilt, from its penalty. And it's condemnation. Unlike these Jews, Andrew, Peter, Philip, Nathaniel, they were looking for the promised seed. These men, you think about it, these men, Philip, Peter, Andrew, Nathaniel, they had, they had been under and had served the same law of Moses. They had heard the same law of Moses. They had read the same and heard the same Psalms that David spoke. They had read and had been instructed from the words from the prophets, both the major and minor prophets. Yet they were looking for and they were hastening for what? A deliverer. But not a deliverer from Roman rule. What were they wanting? They were wanting to be free from sin. I can't help but think of old Simeon. He always comes into my mind when he held our Lord Jesus Christ in his arms said, Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation, the deliverance of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him, and it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Think about that. Seeing God's Christ, the deliverer. And he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought the child Jesus to him, to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, for my eyes have seen thy salvation. Job said, I've heard of you with my ear, but now my eye sees you. And when we see him with that eye of God-given faith, what did he do? His next words, I, I repent in sackcloth and ashes. What? Lord, don't give me what I've earned and merited. Give me what is according to your grace and your mercy. He says, I, Mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of thy people, a light to lighten the Gentiles, and the glory of thy people Israel. Aren't Philip and Nathaniel... Similar to Simon's words, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and in the prophets did write. What? We've seen God's Christ. Where is he? Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. But here's the third thing. All these called by Christ are brought to true faith and true repentance. It says, the day following, verse 43, Jesus would go into Galilee and findeth Philip and saith unto him, Follow me. 
Learned something this week in studying about this. That word follow, you know what it means? You don't think about it like this. I mean, but, you know, we played follow the leader when we were children. And that meant whoever was in the lead, we just followed them. But this word follow here has got a deeper meaning than that. The word translated follow here, it means to join one as a disciple. Uh -huh. It means to become or be his disciple. Or it means to side with his party. Take side with his party. Now we know Philip, what did he immediately become? He became a disciple. He became a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ because the first thing he did was what? Go out and find his brother and bring him to the Lord Jesus Christ and tell him, come see that, see the Christ of God, the one promised to God. And here's the thing. When our Lord called him and spoke to him, what did he do? He immediately followed. There was no hesitancy. There was no thinking about it, no decision to be made because when God calls his sheep, what do they do? They follow. Listen to this. Then came the Jews round about and said unto him, How long do you make us to doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. <laughs> Folks, that's in John chapter 10. He's turned water into wine. He's fed 5,000. He's raised the dead. And they look at him and they said, If you're the Christ, don't make us doubt. Tell us plainly. He could not tell them any more plain than what he's told them. Jesus answered them, I've told you repeatedly what you believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, what? They bear witness of me. That I'm who I said I, said, or said I was and I'm the one sin of God. But you believe, listen, boy, these are some damning words here. But you believe not because you're not my sheep. As, and he was plain, as I said and did. He told these people, you're not my sheep. Then he turns it around the other way. My sheep, those given to me by the Father in everlasting covenant of grace, those who I represent as their surety, substitute, redeemer, savior, my sheep hear my voice. And I know them. That word know means to have an intimate relationship with. I love them. And they follow me. And I give unto them, my sheep, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Christ used that same word follow, meaning all those that he calls, every one of them, you and me included, what do they become? They become his disciples, his followers. We take his side. Here's the fourth thing we learn from these words. The confession of all those called of God and born by the Spirit of God. Nathaniel answered and said unto him, Rabbi, meaning teacher, instructor, thou art the Son of God. Thou art the King of Israel. Listen to the Apostle John's words on this all-important aspect of true faith and true repentance. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. The word translated Jesus Christ is significant. It gets, that word Jesus Christ gets cast around kind of like a mantra in our day. You do realize in the scriptures, every name had a meaning. They didn't just take a book out like we did when Matthew was born. We was, you know, he surprised us, came early. We didn't have a name, and we were scrapping trying to come up with a name, but we came up with Matthew, Stephen. Back then when they named people, they, names meant something. You know, I mean, you think about Methuselah, the name Methuselah. You know what it means? It means when he is gone, it shall come. And when Methuselah died, what came? <laughs> Jesus Christ means a lot more than what the Mexicans call Jesus. It's not just a name. Folks, it's a title. It's an indication of who this person is. And that word translated Jesus Christ, the word Jesus, what does it mean? Jehovah is salvation. 
And the word Christ, what does it mean? It means the anointed. Literally, the Son of God, the Messiah. And this was a confession of every Old Testament saint. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of what? That the Messiah was coming, and embraced them that what? He would put away sin, and confessed what? They're strangers and pilgrims down here in this world. It was a confession of Abraham. What saith the Scriptures? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is a reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him who justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. And I tell you what, this confession by Nathaniel is our confession. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that by this man, by this person is preached unto you, what? forgiveness of sins and by him all who believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses but here's the last thing we learn from these words and this to me is so important to me as a sinner Christ's declaration of the state or standing of all those he represented as their surety their substitute their mediator their Redeemer, and thank God as their friend. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and saith unto him, Behold an Israelite indeed in whom is no God. Let me be as direct and, and brief as I can on this phrase, Behold an Israelite indeed. There's no doubt when you think about it that Nathaniel and his brother Philip were both Israelites by birth. There's no questioning there. But that's not what our Lord Jesus Christ means when he made this statement, Behold an Israelite indeed. When the Apostle Paul, under inspiration of God the Holy Spirit, spoke concerning his national citizenship when he was in a state of unregeneracy, he said this of himself. Now, this is when he's speaking of himself under the, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit about before he was converted. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, an Hebrew of Hebrews. In other words, I'm not a half breed. I am a true Jew. Paul also wrote this, Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they his children. But in Isaac, the child of promise, shall thy seed be called. In Romans chapter 2, verse 28 and 29, Paul made it about as clear as he can. For he is not a Jew who is one inward. Neither is circumcision. No, for he is not a Jew which is one outwardly. Neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one how? Inwardly. Circumcision is that of the heart. What are we talking about there? Regeneration and conversion. In the spirit. And not in letter whose praise is not of men, but who's our praise from? Our praises of God. That, the root word for the word Israelite, you know what it is? It's Israel. And the word Israel, you know what Israel means, in the, especially in the New Testament? It means Christian. It means the Israel of God. Paul used it like this, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them and mercy upon the Israel of God. He said, Behold an Israelite indeed. That word indeed means in truth. In reality. For Christ was declaring of him and all God's elect in every generation, what are they truly? They're the Israel of God. Which he was sent to seek and to save. 
I wrote this into my notes this morning right before I came here. Tell ye and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from that ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there's no God else beside me, a just God and a Savior. These Jews that sent to inquire of Christ, they, that's who they should have been looking for. A just God and a Savior. There's none beside me. That's all this God's about. A just God and a Savior. Look unto me, who? A just God and a Savior. And be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, both Jew and Gentile. God's people from every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. For I am God, and there's none else. I've sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return. That every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess. Where do you see that at? Philippians chapter 2. It's not talking about to those in hell bowing. Who's, who, every knee will bow, and every tongue of Israel will confess. What will they confess? Surely shall one say in the Lord, Have our righteousness and strength, even to him shall men come, and all that are enraged against this person, this Messiah, shall be ashamed in the Lord. Listen to this. In the Lord shall the seed of Israel be justified and shall glory. As for this next statement, he said of man, Nathaniel, in whom is no God. In whom is no God. I was kind of puzzled when I was studying this this week. And I read a lot of different commentators, a lot of old men that wrote on this thing, and I read a lot of different things about it, but a lot of them said that this statement, in whom is no guile, that what our Lord meant by this when he said this to Nathaniel was that he was a sincere, dedicated, religious person. That's kind of my reaction when I read that. Some of them even wrote, they went this far, because you know they said that, that where was he at? He was under a fig tree. And they said that the religious people, including the scribes and Pharisees, you know, they, they spent their time because the fig tree at that time was a big tree. And they stood under the fig tree because of the leaves for the shade in the cool. And that's where they read the scriptures at. It's in the shade. And they tried to make that connection, and that's what's going on there, that he was a sincere, dedicated guy just studying his tail off, you know, and trying to, to learn more and know more and get closer, but... Listen, sincerity and morality, that's not the issue here. It's not what our Lord's dealing with. This word translated guile means craft, deceit, or subtlety. And I know one thing. You know what guile is? If you have guile, what is it? It's sin, right? The wages of sin, death. And yet our Lord looks at Nathaniel and he said, this is the Lord of glory, he looks at a man and he says, an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile. Not, he meant by that not an inkling of guile. Not an inkling of deceit or subtlety or craftiness. Well, was Christ saying that Nathaniel wasn't a sinner? Is that what he meant by that? This is the man that is sinlessly perfect. Is that what our Lord was saying when he made this statement? Absolutely not. What was Nathaniel? Nathaniel was a sinner. Nathaniel was looking for a savior, a redeemer. I think the passage that clears it up is the one we read in the call to worship this morning. Because it uses a similar word. Blessed transgressions forgiven. Blessed Sins covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin, comma, and whose spirit is no guile. So you know what that lets me know? The one that has no guile, what's already occurred for him? <laughs> 
His iniquities are covered. His transgressions are forgiven. And listen, thank, thank God he will never have sin charged to him. Ever! You say, oh, preacher, you say that, people will live like they want to. I'm pretty much certain you live like you want to anyhow, if we're honest. That Hebrew word, no guile, there used in Psalm 32, it means no lackness, no slackness, no slackening, no deceit, no treachery. Religious people like to turn the order around on this thing. And they like to make, they think something like this. They think that the one in whom there's no lackness, no slackness, no deceit, no treachery, they'll have their sins forgiven. That's not what this says. It's the exact opposite. The one who's blessed, the one who has eternal life, the one in whom is no guile. What? Why do they have no guile? Their sins are put away. Remember King David? When Nathan told him that story. And see, people, people, religious people forget all these things. Find me in the scriptures where David was walking around mourning about what he had done with Bathsheba or Uriah the Hittite. Find it for me. Find where he had ever admitted that he had at any point in time up to when Nathan confronted him. Show me from the scriptures where David was mourning and weeping about the fact that he had got this woman pregnant, a man's wife pregnant, and put him to death to cover his treachery. You tell me that was guile in that man. And Nathan tells him that story about the little ewe lamb and David becomes enraged, Remember? And he says, the man that did this thing fourfold. And old Nathan pointed that finger at him. He said, David, you're the man. And what was David's next words? Huh? Nathan, I pray that you would pray to God that this would not be charged to me. What were Nathan's words to King David? Who could, Nathan. David could have ordered Nathan put to death and nobody could have stopped him. What was his next words? Nathan's words to David. The Lord hath put away thy sin. That was where this is born from, Psalm 32. Blessed is the man whose sins are forgiven, whose iniquities are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not charge sin. He knew he was filled with guile in his own person. But as he stood in Christ, what was he? He was without God. He was holy. He was unblameable. He was unreprovable in his sight. Made the very righteousness of God in him. I ask you to ask yourself and answer one question in your own mind this morning. Are you an Israelite indeed in whom is no God? Are you? I tell you, if you are, you know where you're at this morning? If any man be in Christ, new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. How are they become new? Only one way. He made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Don't you thank God through Christ Jesus our Lord that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. What a blessedness to know that God will never charge sin to you ever because every single solitary sin you have ever committed or will ever commit, Christ bore them all in his body on the tree and by his stripes we are healed. And you know what? God's children don't use that to excuse their remaining sinfulness but we use it as a motivation to trust and believe our God that He's faithful and He will never never leave us and He will never forsake us. Let's stand together and we'll be dismissed. Lord bless you, keep you till we see you next Lord's Day. Pray that He'll bless that word to your heart, mind, and understanding. Kenny, if you would, dismiss us, please. Father in heaven, Almighty God, Lord, we're so thankful to have this opportunity to once again come back here to meet with each brother in a right special place, Lord. Father, for satisfaction for our sins, for a representative substitute 
is absolutely and completely and eternally wiped away our sins through his own obedience unto death, even the death of the cross. Lord, I pray that you would take us from this place, that you would protect us as we travel to our respective homes. Lord, I pray, Father, that you would bring us back at the next point in time. It's in Christ's name.